please permit me to go to the Himalayas. I hope in unbroken solitude to achieve continuous divine communion. I actually once addressed these ungrateful words to my master. Seized by one of the unpredictable delusions that occasionally assail the devotee, I felt a growing impatience with hermitage duties and college studies. Many hillmen live in the Himalayas, yet possess no God perception. My guru's answer came slowly and simply. Wisdom is better sought from a man of realization than from an inert mountain. Ignoring Master's plain hint that he, and not a hill, was my teacher, I repeated my plea. Sri Yukteswar vouchsafed no reply. I took his silence for consent. He patted my shoulder. Young yogi, I see you are running away from your master. He has everything you need. You should return to him. He added, mountains cannot be your guru. The same thought that Sri Yukteswar had expressed two days earlier. Masters are under no cosmic compulsion to live on mountains only. My companion glanced at me quizzically. The Himalayas in India and Tibet have no monopoly on saints. His simple words instantaneously banished my lifelong obsession for the Himalayas. I am here, Guruji. My shamefacedness spoke more eloquently for me. Let us go to the kitchen and find something to eat. Sri Yukteswar's manner was as casual as though hours and not days had separated us. Master, I must have disappointed you by my abrupt departure from my duties here. I thought you might be angry with me. No, of course not. Wrath springs only from thwarted desires. I do not expect anything from others, so their actions cannot be in opposition to wishes of mine. I would not use you for my own ends. I am happy only in your own true happiness. Sir, one hears of divine love in a vague way, but today I am indeed having a concrete example of it from your angelic self. In the world, even a father does not easily forgive his son if he leaves his parents' business without warning. But you show not the slightest vexation, though you must have been put to great inconvenience by the many unfinished tasks I left behind. We looked into each other's eyes, where tears were shining. A blissful wave engulfed me. I was conscious that the Lord, in the form of my Guru, was expanding the limited ardours of my heart to vast reaches of cosmic love. A few mornings later, I made my way to Master's empty sitting room. I planned to meditate, but my laudable purpose was unshared by disobedient thoughts. They scattered like birds before the hunter. Mukunda! Sri Yukteswar's voice sounded from a distant balcony. I felt as rebellious as my thoughts. Master always urges me to meditate, I muttered to myself. He should not disturb me when he knows why I came to his room. He summoned me again. I remained obstinately silent. The third time his tone held rebuke. Sir, I am meditating, I shouted protestingly. I know how you are meditating, my guru called out. 
with your mind distributed like leaves in a storm, come here to me. Thwarted and exposed, I made my way sadly to his side. Poor boy, mountains cannot give you what you want. Master spoke caressingly, comfortingly. His calm gaze was unfathomable. Your heart's desire shall be fulfilled. Suddenly the breath returned to my lungs. With a disappointment almost unbearable, I realized that my infinite immensity was lost. Once more, I was limited to the humiliating cage of a body. My guru was standing motionless before me. I started to prostrate myself at his holy feet in gratitude for his having bestowed on me the experience in cosmic consciousness that I had long passionately sought. He held me upright, and said quietly, You must not get over-drunk with ecstasy. Much work yet remains for you in the world. Come, let us sweep the balcony floor. Then we shall walk by the Ganges. Master, I knew, was teaching me the secret of balanced living. The soul must stretch over the cosmogonic abysses, while the body performs its daily duties. When Sri Yukteswar and I set out later for a stroll, I was still entranced in unspeakable rapture. I saw our bodies as two astral pictures, moving over a road by the river whose essence was sheer light. It is the Spirit of God that actively sustains every form and force in the universe. Yet He is transcendental and aloof in the blissful, uncreated void beyond the worlds of vibratory phenomena. Master explained, The Lord has created all men, 
from the illimitable joy of his being. Though they are painfully cramped by the body, God nevertheless expects that men made in his image shall ultimately rise above all sense identifications and reunite with him. For months after the first time, I entered the state of ecstatic union, comprehending daily why the Upanishads say that God is Rasa, the most relishable. One morning, however, I took a problem to Master. I want to know, sir, when shall I find God? You have found him. Oh, no, sir, I don't think so. My guru was smiling. I understand now, sir, while saints call the Lord unfathomable. Even everlasting life could not suffice to appraise him. After 48, he didn't speak regularly, as he had always done, alternating between San Diego and Hollywood temples, one Sunday, one next Sunday, and the other temple. He spoke only a few times and more sporadically, and he began to spend then more time at the desert. He used to say, because people continued to write, you know, missing seeing him, but he would say, I can do much more now to reach, to reach others with my pen. Receive, my beloved, receive. Oh. 